Greetings my friends, how are you doing? This is Zed from Zed Outdoors and I hope you're having an awesome day. So today I have come down to see friend and talented craftsman Harald Lamont of Liepelhaus. Harald, how are you doing? Hi Zed, fine thank you. How are you? I'm not too bad, thank you. Did I pronounce your name correctly? Yeah, almost. <laughs> <laughs> almost. As British people, we always mispronounce foreign names. So I've been practicing off camera to make sure I've got it down <laughs> properly. So if you're not familiar with Harald, Harald is originally from Belgium, more specifically Bruges. He is a full-time green woodworker. He's currently on a short road trip here in the United Kingdom. And while he's passing through a mutual friend's house, Lee Stoffer, if you've been familiar with my channel you see Lee make many appearances so while Harald is spending time with Lee, Lee very kindly allowed us to use his space currently to film a video with Harald. Now this video what Harald is going to be kindly demonstrating is his process for carving the eating spoon starting from a fresh piece of wood all the way to a finished product and what this video is is an introduction of Harald to you guys because what it is the hope is later this year uh, we're arranging for me to come over yeah that uh, would be amazing to Bruges uh, and Belgium to visit Harald and the amazing community he's got over there so in this video like I said Harald is going to be demonstrating his process for carving an eating spoon now a few things to quickly get out the way before we begin the actual video number one this video is time stamped into the different sections as you can see it's quite a long video so the important thing is you can see the different sections that we're talking about as you watch through this video in the description below there is also a separate timestamp on the left hand side of that you will see the actual numbers relating to what section of the video that is YouTube has a very cool feature if you click on that time it will jump straight to that particular section the hope is this video is kind of a teaching aid to you so as you move forward if you want to jump straight to a section you can do that also needless to say I will be putting a link down below to Harold's Instagram you can find it a lot more and see a lot more of the work that he does and also I will be putting a link below down to his website so what we're going to do first and foremost is what we're going to be looking at is a selection of Harald spoons as well as other beautiful green woodworking items he has made and then we're going to proceed with the rest of this video so Harald with your kind permission shall we begin yes please <laughs> so let's do that <laughs> very polite so there you go guys I hope you enjoyed the rest of the video where Harald Lamont is going to be teaching you how to carve a spoon So one very important thing for me to mention is we are filming in an urban location and this is the weekend. If you happen to hear background noise of cars and noises or whatnot, that's why I do apologize in advance, but we're trying to keep this as real as possible. So let's crack on with the video. So Harald, we're looking at a selection of your items here. Obviously you've driven across from Belgium to yeah. England. So obviously whatever you can fit into your car. Um, so before we get into the actual items themselves, um, I'm curious and no doubt the audience will be curious to know a little bit about yourself. So what is your journey into green woodworking? It's been a long journey, I think, like, like a lot of us, uh, wood always had a special meaning in my life, wood and trees, and so as a child I'll, I always worked with wood and tried to make bows and arrows and make little furniture for my room and stuff like that, and then when I got older I, uh, I tried to make different stuff, but then I got into to university and, and um, so wood got a bit at the, at the background, uh, but then later on I started um, like a classic carving uh, course, like with mallets and chisels and gouges. Um, I learned a lot there, but that wasn't what I was looking for. We made like curls that you see in churches and stuff. It was not really my thing, but I learned a lot. But um, then I renovated and, and our house, made a tree house, made a barn out of oak. So wood always came back into my life, but then I think about 12 years ago, something like that, um, I saw a guy just carve a spoon out of a, a branch with just a, an axe and a knife and a spoon knife. And I thought, wow, I have to, I have to try that. So, and it all started off from that first spoon. Well, it wasn't actually a spoon. I made like a club with a, with a hole in it, uh, but it looked like a spoon a bit. So and from there on, it was trial and error. There weren't that many books around, uh, certainly not any courses in Belgium and stuff. So. 
Um, at the beginning it was very slow, but then my product started getting better and I uh, gave a first workshop and people were enthusiastic and so it, it got on from there and then um, I started working less. Uh, I'm a psychologist by education. Um, then I started working less and then take more time for me to carve and teach uh, spoon carving. And then about four years ago I uh, took a jump or a leap to, I really thought I want to do that for the rest of my life full time. So I quit my job and for, for several years now I'm full time uh, green woodworker. So, so yeah. in, in, in Bruges, so you have your own setup in Bruges, don't you? Yeah, so our house is called the Spoon House. So in Dutch it's Lepelhuis. Um, and our house in front of the house is that's my little workshop and it has just some big windows in front where I put all my stuff out that I make for, and, and I sell. Um, and the courses go in, um, happen in the, we call it the Spoon Forest. So it's a little patch of woodlands nearby and I have a setup there with like um, uh, a covered space with workbench and chopping blocks and a, and a campfire area and a little hut. So it's a nice quiet woodland space to do the courses. Yeah. And so just for my geographic uh, understandings, just so people have a better understanding if they're not familiar. So in Belgium, you're in the northern region of Belgium, is that correct? Yeah, in Flanders. So my native tongue is Dutch, uh, as in the Netherlands. Um, so and the southern part is French. So I live in Bruges, that's the Flemish part. So uh, we speak Dutch. Excellent. So coming now to your actual uh, green woodworking over here. So maybe if we start here at the end, would you like to talk us through what we're looking at? Yeah, so <clears throat> for me it all started with spoons and it's still one of my favorite stuff to make and, and also to teach because for a lot of people spoons is like their first intro into the, the great world of green woodworking and it's very um, it's a more easy project to start off with on a day course or something so but I still love making spoons and as you can see I have a whole different different set of yeah different shapes and different woods and different finishes and different and that's a bit who I am I, I never use templates or I just like to carve different stuff and that makes it makes it exciting for me every day again so so starting off with the spoon at the end there Harald would you like to talk us through what we're looking at I think they're like, um, it's like a type of dolphin spoon. Um, I love the, the way you have a, a very pronounced side profile and it looks, the interesting thing is on the side, people often look like on the spoon that way, so it makes it more interesting to look at that way. So and you get a, get a real thin neck and it gives a lot of strength if you keep that high, but the highness you can choose where to put it. So if you put it in a bump up there, so it's much more interesting just to do it straight. So. And what wood is that? That's beech. That's beech. Yeah, I like using and trying different species of trees. I once made a whole selection of 50 spoons lookalikes mm -hmm. from 50 different types of trees just to experiment experience how they work and how they feel and how they look so excellent and the next spoon along yeah that's an that's elder um, we had some fungus in it so it changed colors uh, when I carved the green uh, it was actually green color but now it turned a bit brownish so I love making facets um, and I try a little ball at the end I love playing also with different finishes, like I, I love oak, uh, so if you ebonize it, it's like uh, get really nice and dark. And then here is the difference between the ebonized hardwood and, and like the sapwood. That's, uh, that doesn't get so much tannins in there, so it doesn't ebonize as black, but you get the nice contrasts. It looks like a spoon that's been used for ages, but it's just recently carved. And that's a spoon made of Japanese cherry I got gifted. Um, and what I love about it is like, you have like the, the traces of a, I think like a woodworm was just beneath the bark. So it was so beautiful, I can't carve that myself. So, and the contrast between like the clean lines and the, it's, I think that's nice. As you can see, it's all different types of shapes and woods and finishes and like I, lo I love using bits and pieces of bark left or um, 
to really see where the spoon came from. It's not from some perfect piece of straight wood, it's just from a branch, from a tree. So, and I love choosing stuff that reminds where the wood came from. So, it's a nat natural product and I like to show that. And then the next spoon along? The long one. Um, walnut, one of my favorite woods. Um, it's quite a big spoon because it was heavily spalted, like you can see the orangey, pinky color in there. So it was like on the edge of being usable, but it was so beautiful I still wanted to make something out of it. But I compensated a bit for strength, so I left it a bit thicker everywhere to make it still strong enough for use. That's a lovely wood. And these are a bit like, that's a bit what I'm gonna make today, like an eating spoon, um, but with like an asymmetric handle. That's a kind of shape I, I make a lot. Yeah, just like it. It doesn't, I like symmetrical bowls, but I like to, to make the handles a bit more off, so. And I don't use a template, but it always ends up like a bit like the same feathery shape. I think, I think that idea started off when I make like a real feather spoon, where, where you um, um, see the, the growth rings. And if you cut them in that way, they enhance the feathery shape. And so I started off f first making that feather shaped handle. And then I kept doing that on just regular spoons. So. Some cooking spoons, spalted alder. When wood is spalted, it just makes it so much more alive and interesting to look at. Because alder can be quite plain and equal. And that's like the same spoon made of ash. And here you have the growth rings again, that's showing off. And that was a spatula, or is, I mean, with uh, the cambium layer. Mm -hmm. That, um, I don't know if it's if it fungus or bacteria uh, starting to color the cambium layer. So I wanted to use that into the, to the handle. So it's a very humble or simple spatula, but the, that takes all the credit or the, the niceness. So that's a bit of a selection of my spoons and then I sometimes carve balls, that was from a, a birch burl. Um, that's probably the, one of the only things sanded in here because the grain was so over, all over the place I couldn't get a clean finish with my tools. But most of the stuff I just carve. And then I love making shrink pots as you can see. Yeah, that's a very beautiful range of shrink pots, a lot of different designs, huh? Yeah, thank you. Um, I, yeah, I just love making shrink pots, like, um, and I use a lot of pale woods. I have a lot of uh, sycamore in our woodland. Um, so I, I like to not paint spoons, but the pale sycamore can be nice in itself, like this one. With the spalted, I think it was, yeah, beach uh, lit. But the, the beauty in a shrink pot is like in the process, or how the bottom shrinks. Uh, uh, into the, the pots, so and it lends itself nice for a little bit of paint, a little bit of color, a little bit of decorative um, techniques. And I, I like to try different methods of making lids, like this is a, a lid made in two pieces, so they glue together, that's like the quick way of uh, making a lid. And that one is like uh, a lid in one piece of wood, and a spalted beach as well. And then the next extra level or step is like the closing lid ones. So you can open it and open it up. Oh, that's a very cool design of the lid. And yeah. then close it back up. I think it's like, I saw that in Sweden when I visited Fritjof. It's a, he has a whole house full of beautiful stuff. And then actually one of my favorite things are like the the candle holders, is that correct? Because you actually don't have to carve a lot, but you can put some facets on, but um, like the joy or the challenge is finding the, just the right pieces of wood in the woodland, because trees tend, tend to 
have branches on certain levels and they're split into twos. But of course you need at least three legs to, to make a nice candle holder. So it's really utilizing a lot of the pieces that you... Yeah. I find that when, I, when a tree fell down in our woodland or I cut down a tree, I think it's important to really think about how to make the best use of the tree as, as a respect to the tree. The, he, it, growed, it grew for maybe 50 or 100 or even more years and I, I try to use every last bit of it in my carvings or, and the last stuff is just on, on the fire to get warm. So that's nice. And then we have some uh, more easy stuff maybe, some like coat hangers. Um, and I, I do a lot of teaching also with kids. So these are like um, little tri sticks or for the small ones we call them wands. And uh, you, you can just practice their knife grips on there and then sometimes make like little Christmas trees or and these like the, the crisp back clips, stuff like that. Just easy, just from a branch, and yeah, just make a so they drill a hole, make a soaker, and do some carving on it. But it's just useful. So. And then lastly, we've got a very, very stylish bag. <laughs> <laughs> so this is your tool bag, huh? Yeah, it's my tool bag. It was gifted to me from my wife uh, last year at Spoontown. Um, very lovely bag. And then I, over here we have some. Um, <coughs> real green woodwork like bit furniture like the, the stools um, I learned to make those from well I did courses with uh, Vershout in Holland with Jop and Schorsch and also Mike Abbott I did some course uh, did a course there so uh, and this one I made with Ben Willis so it's a lovely piece of ash so so these are with um, how you call that so the, mort the mortise and tenons but mm -hmm. they, sh they, they, they shrunk and it's without glue so, and that one is uh, glued up with wedges, so. It's beautiful. So you really do play around with a lot of different designs and. Yeah, that's what I, I never like to do the same thing twice, mostly. I sometimes do when I get an order for maybe 20 spoons or but then it's a challenge, but I love making different stuff and every day is something else and something new and so. And then that's my, my spoon chair. That's where I sit in. Yeah, almost every day, carving or reading or... So I was so impressed when I saw this, we're setting up for filming. <laughs> <laughs> this is beautiful. Thank you, Zet. So where did you make this? Was this over here or back in Belgium? It was in Holland with, uh, with uh, my friends Jop and Schors. Um, so that was the first course um, uh, I did on chair making. And then I made the seat at home and finished the spoons. And what, is it, what material is the seating from? Well, it's an, I'm happy you ask because I, I make myself a challenge to... It's all made out of woods from uh, my woodland. And, um, and every piece of the chair, it has some hardwood and some sapwood in it. So that was the, the challenge I put myself. Like, like on the spoons, you see the sapwood coming through in the bowl. And here you see the sapwood and the hardwood. So it's in every bit of the chair. Took a lot of work, but it's nice, something for the rest of my life, I think. So there's like a very um, nice ecosystem by the sounds of it. So you have your workshop in Bruges, you have your woodland, and obviously you're sourcing a lot of materials from your woodland yeah. and repurposing that into all sorts of various green woodworking items. Yeah, I'm, I'm also gifted a lot of wood from uh, people at our Spoon Club. So it's nice. I, I, I've put myself the challenge to um, every month in Spoon Club, I, I bring a new kind of wood. And now I, I, I could keep that promise now for two years now, or two years and a half. So that's nice to, to play around with different kinds of wood. And some come from the woodland, but a lot of people just bring wood. And if you, if you get the word out, uh, people are, are, are happy to, to give you wood and to make some stuff out of it. So. So I think one thing to actually finish up on is that very topic. I think it's very important because people watching the video are from various parts of the world. Yeah. So if there happen to be people who are in Belgium or the Netherlands, do you want to briefly talk about your spoon club? 
Um, yeah, so it's a Thursday evening event. I think we're about with 40 participants now. Um, some come once or a month, some twice. Uh, so it's just me bringing wood, tools, uh, uh, mostly a pie and some, some drinks, and just happy carve together. And it can be spoons, mostly spoons, but can carve some other stuff as well. Yeah, some people. Uh, they can make cooksers as well. We haven't shown the cooksers, yeah. Oh, so, yes, yes, yeah. we forgot about that. It's a good thing we remembered. <laughs> yeah, no, just love making cooksers. Um, it's a bit of more work, of course, than a spoon, but like drinking coffee out of that is so much nicer and cozier than uh, just from a normal cup. So yeah, we can do whatever people want in, in Spoon Club. Um, there's a whole bunch of chopping blocks and bigger ones for clamping and there's a workbench and so if everybody should um, maybe visit Bruges at one time and you're there on a Thursday evening just give me a call or a, or a text and happy to, to invite you to Spoon Club. Yeah, yeah because I know there's, there are uh, people who view the channel that are from Belgium and the Netherlands and obviously yeah. People visiting uh, Bruges, obviously a very popular destination. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's very kind of you. But yeah, details for that will be down below on your website. Okay. And also, people I think can message you via Instagram. Um, so, as a final step, then before we begin the video, you're going to be carving an asymmetrical spoon, similar to what you've shown over here. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, it's a bit like. Um, they're not always the same shape, but I tend to make it a little bit feathery, so that's the point. Um, we we'll look at I have a nice piece of cherry with me from Belgium, and so uh, we we'll look at the piece and see how it works out. And I'm not sure how the, the spoon will be in the wood, but that's always a surprise. That's always um, just finding out uh, with, with certain pieces of wood. I. As I said, I don't use templates, but like the same thing, I never, I, I, I'm not always using it tangentially or radially or just what the wood tell, tells me and how it looks. I try to make the most of the wood, so as I will show next. Yeah. So, Harald, are we going to begin with the axing process? Yeah. So I have a nice piece of cherry, um, the center was really off, so it's a bit of reaction wood, so, but for spoon carving that's not a problem. And this is a, a piece that you brought from Belgium, is that correct? Yeah. So on that, on that note, a question I have for you, and yeah. the viewers may be curious as well, is what are woods that are common to where you live? I think we have broadly the same kind of species that you do have in England, well, with some exceptions. I think we have a bit less, um, but the, the biggest difference is we have, we have much less woodlands. So especially in the province where I live, close to the sea, um, I think there's only 4% surface area that is woodland. So wood is kind of scarce and it's not very easy to come by. For me it's a difference because we have a little patch of woodland. But for a lot of people it's uh, not that easy. So we have the same species but um, not, it's not ready available. And, and then of course with the heat prices going up people like to burn more wood than maybe before. Oh so yes, yeah, I didn't that, think about that. That didn't help <laughs> for the green woodworker. <laughs> yeah. but. Like I said, if you get the word out, let people know you're looking for wood and why and that you want to make things out of it, people will help you. So there are different ways to, to get wood. But it can be a challenge uh, in, in my country to get especially nice pieces of wood. You have the woodland species, but like, like I said, like the walnut or uh, nice pieces of cherry, that's hard to come by. So for that reason, I brought the cherry because that's something rare for me to, to have and to carve. So. Um, I wanted to share that. So in terms of the process, uh, where would you like to begin? So I was thinking like, uh, I split that half now and then where is the spoon is, is going to be and have some different choices. And I thought it was maybe interesting to, to talk a bit about my choice in that because um, if you would want it radially, you have a, the spoon would be like that and then you see the the lines of the growth rings running through the spoon like that but then you need like depending on the size you mean maybe that section so to split it can be like I can split it in half 
and then maybe split that off, but that, that's lost, so I can't use that. So, and if you do it tangentially, you have two choices. You can put the spoon with the bark is the top side, but then if you look at the spoon, of course, the spoon comes down, so the, the ball of the spoon is more down and the handle comes up. So if you would do it like that, then if the ball, if you split out like maybe that pie section, I need like four and a half centimeters to accommodate for the spoon ball, so I can't use that bit. Yeah, so I often make them, I call it reverse tangential, so that, that it's sitting like that. So I can use the top bit, just not the whole way, but here I can just get wide enough for the handle. And then when I come down, I have the widest section I can use for the ball. So if you have like a piece, it's different if you have a big lock and you can split it all different ways and can choose whatever direction you want. If I have like a smaller lock, I often split them like a cake and then do them reverse tangential so I can take or use the most of the woods um, to make a spoon. I have, have less uh, waste. waste. Yeah. So you're constantly thinking about how to use the maximum amount of wood, basically. I try to. It's always a, a balance between using the woods and like here I have a, like a, knot, a side branch broke off probably. So um, normally I would really embrace that and I would go for that piece. But because it's a video and I, I don't... <laughs> <laughs> I just go for a normal piece, so yeah. Okay. So you've chosen this piece now, so what next? Next is uh, just going to split it off. So in terms of your axe, before we begin that, um, would you like to talk a little bit about your axe? Yeah, so I think that's still my favorite axe. Um, I don't want to... Um, that's, that's a Hans Carlsen axe. Um, because I, I teach a lot and I, I always find it myself interesting to see different tools and different makers. So in my toolbox for teaching, I have like 10 different kinds of axes from different makers. So um, that's, that's, the, that's a big plus when you teach. You always have a reason to buy new tools. <laughs> so uh, um, I love the one from Julia as well. Uh, Nordman tools are amazing. Um, but for some reason, I keep get going back to that one. And I think it has a lot to do with, um, of course, the weight and the balance. It's really very nice balanced. So when you choke up on it, and there's the balance, balance point, that means you don't have to put extra effort or, or power into, into moving the axe. So that's perfectly balanced, as other axes are as well. But maybe a little detail that, that works for me is like, the, if you would, would have a cross section of the handle, um, it's a bit like um, like the, the wings of an airplane shaped, so a bit rounded at the back and more to a taper in the front. And in the beginning I f it felt like awkward, but then I got to use it more. It feels like um, this feels comfortable in my hand here, but the more pointy front um, actually helps me to direct the axe better. So what was at the beginning like an odd thing I really learned to value, uh, to, to value it, and now it's one of my favorite things about that axe. So. Excellent, so now you're going to split this piece off then? Yeah. With a big log, I wouldn't use my carving axe, but with just that little piece that would... So the idea is how far I'm going to split off, because like an eating spoon, for average people, it's the, the, the most wide part of the bowl is like four and a half centimeters give or take. So I have to, in that section, I have to have four and a half centimeters. So, and maybe a little extra, of course, but, so that would be somewhere there. So I just room enough to make the bowl, and I have the height to make a nice crank into the spoon as well. So. And it's cherry. So it doesn't split that easy. Once you get it going, you just, oops, watch your step. <coughs> uh, 
Okay. So, um, to no normally I start on the bottom side. I, I start on the side profile of the spoon and I start on the bottom side. But just to know how far up I can go with my underside of the spoon, like let me show you. Um, like the spoon is going to end up a bit like that. So I can go way, use the bottom side and then let the ball come up. But to know how far I can go up here, I have to create a bit of a flat on top first. So just flat and wide enough to accommodate for the handle. Yeah. Once I establish that, then I know my bottom is right at the edge of the wood and I can use the whole depth of the spoon to make the crank. I hope that does make sense, Seth. Please let me know if it doesn't. I will do, thank you. So I get a flat section up here. So and that's almost wide enough to get that maybe just a tiny bit more. Yeah, that's more than plenty. So that's wide enough to later on be the top of my handle. And I know now I can use that height to make my crank. So I start off now at the bottom side and try to do it level or perpendicular. So first I cut the underside of my ball. And again, I can't go to go too high up because I lose width. So but that that's still just quite right for the width of my ball. And then I come from here about will be the the crank, the point where it uh, turns. So from that point on, I have to go way up there, just leave a little bit for the handle, of course. So if it's an eating spoon, yeah, so this is like the four and a half centimeters. On average, that's about six maybe. So the ball, that's the underside, will be around here. So the crank, especially for an eating spoon, I like to put it in one third from, from the neck. So here's approximately will be the crank. So from there on, I can carve all the way, like the underside of the handle, up to there. So eventually, the front of my spoon will end up be here. And the back of my handle will be here. Okay, so I can, from here on, can yeah, put some, how do you call those? It's a force. It's a bit bouncy on the deck here. So I'm getting there, I'm not level, so I have to level it out a bit. Getting there. So that's enough for now. And if you look at it, now I have the, the underside of my spoon made. It's not the, 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 the definite shape, I put some curves in it later on but that's the basics yeah so from there on I know that's my underside now we're gonna do the top side I don't want to saw in or chop in my crank just now because I have so much wood from the top of my handle it has to come off anyway until up here the top of my spoon so what I do is first chop that off just in that direction I don't want to be sawing in first and then doing the awkward that way because you, if you do it that way you have to put it down. I don't want to do that just now because it's much easier to just do the bulk of it, cut it off that way. So when I get to that point, the top of my ball here, then I have just a little bit to saw in to make the crank. So I end up with that, something like that. Just 
check it once in a while. A bit more. Yeah, about there. So now I have that and I still need to make like the crank, a little crank in the spoon. Just makes it nicer to eat or to use. There are two ways to go about it. Um, you can saw it in a little bit or you can chop it in. You make like a little V. And it doesn't have to be really neat. Just that you sever the fibers. A bit like that. Like so. Because when I come down now from here, I don't want, if I make a split in the woods, I don't want it to run all the way and split off the top of my ball. So, and then the question is where, from where I go down to that section. So depending on the top shape of your handle, if you want to have like a curvy, I have to leave that one and start from here. If I wanted to have straight, I have to start off from right at the back. So I like a little curve up here, so maybe do a double crank later on. So I start off from here. At the last I have to be a bit more gentle, so I put my elbow more into my body for more control and take a little bit of thin chops just at the end. Gen be more gentle. I don't want to split the rest off. So. So that's that. And then because of the grain direction or the cutting direction, I have to go it that way. Some people do it like that and I can, but I'm like, my finger is too close up. So I, I don't want to do that because it can, it can go right a thousand times, but once maybe you're tired or just not paying attention. So that's much safer. Oops. Like that. Clean it up a bit, just enough to make a drawing on there. The rest I clean up with the knife. Check it a bit like it's level. Okay. So at that stage you could do maybe little bits of the sides or you can just do that in the next section. But So that's my side profile. Uh, mostly done um, and then I make a drawing on top so that's m mostly the moment where I just sit down and I, I start with the center line get my pencil out um, and over here I'm not a g good drawer <laughs> how do you say that so a center line really helps to to make something more um, symmetrical. But I don't want to make a symmetrical handle, but... So you can put in some uh, points of reference and then with a little bendy ruler, you can do the whole... A bit like that. So when I talked about the four and a half, and uh, I just got that dead on, actually. So... That's just a four and a half I want for the spoon, yeah. Any suggestions, Zed, on which spoon to make? Um, whatever you feel, whatever you feel like making. Okay, a bit like that. So I like the neck to be like a curvy neck. I don't like corners here. So from that first section, I like to do symmetrical. But then when I do the, sim the, the feathery shape, the thing is, I go, I start off straight, and then I'm, I'm like, I have a little hollow. So that's a hollow, and that hollow goes over into a convex shape, like that. And because I have more wood on that side, the pointy bit of the feather has to come across the center line. 
because otherwise it looks out of balance. So, and, and the other side is a bit more first straightish again, like up till here I'm symmetrical. But then it just goes on, on a kind of straight line. Then you have a straight and a straight at an angle, meeting at the point of the feather. So you constantly have that line as a point of reference? Yeah. So it's not symmetrical, but it helps to, to see the balance. So if you look at it now, it's still too heavy maybe on that side. So maybe a bit curve a bit sooner into there. And then, yeah, something like that. So one of the reasons I do the side profile first is because um, one is I put the drawing on now um, so I can exit out but then when, when we go to the knife work the drawing is still on there so as a reference to start the knife work so that's one. The second thing is like because of the crank you have to saw or cut in here and then you have the difficult bit more difficult uh, thing to do like that so that's a bit more difficult than the rest but if you because it's an, an, in, um, an inner curve, so you have to saw it in. But if you look on the top profile, we're going to have the same thing on the smallest section of our handle as well. But because we have two more difficult sections to do instead of one, it makes sense that you make that thin first to make those two difficult ones easier. So that's an extra reason to do the side profile first and then the top profile. Now that said, you can be, of course, flexible. You have to be flexible with those steps, but it all depends on the wood, on the type of spoon you're making. Sometimes, um, like if you do like a pie, uh, how do you say that, a pie scoop? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so then that shape is really important. You get the, the growth rings or the... the, 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 the the grain straight in there so you really have to look at that side first but sometimes you have like if you have like a beautiful knot you want to put in the middle of the handle I totally shape out and carve out the, the top side first just because I want the knot to be in the middle of the handle so I do it totally the opposite way but just think about the steps and they have benefits or downsides what to do first or what to do next so so now I don't just cut in or saw in that just yet because I want to remove all the wood I can before I do that. So that's what I call, learn that from Mikey, um, elephants, like the mummy stage. You go from the widest part of your bowl all the way up down to the widest part of your handle. So it's like if you would mummify your spoon or make a, make a, a coffin for a spoon, it would look a bit like that. So that outside, we cut away first. That's quick and easy. Um, yeah, you can choose now, do I do the ball side first or the handle side? The reason I do the ball side first is because if I wanted to catch that line, that one, it's going to be way up here to get right into that line. And that's a bit more dangerous because you're going high up. You can put your fingers away, but still it's very high up. So if I do that side first, like so, then if I want to catch that line, I can start off here instead of all the way back up there as I showed before. So then I can a bit gentle here. So and it doesn't have to be straight, you can hold it out a bit, just as long as you come down here, you don't hit the widest part of your handle, so I'm just right about there, and then you can get that roughly in as well, same thing on the other side, there was a small split there, but I just think I can work around it, you see I'm tilting the spoon, I always keep trying to chop straight down. Makes me, it makes it easier just to direct the axe. And like I always say, like the the, the right hand or the axe hand is like the machine that goes up and down all day. And that one is the artist. That one moves around and dictates the shapes and the design. Other way around.
a bit like that. And we can finish it off, rounding it off, or we can do late later. So next step is to, I could have gone a bit more inwards here, but. So next step is to sever those fibers, because if we come down, because we have to go for the, gr for the cutting direction, have to go that way, from, from wide to narrow. I don't want to split to run all the way through and ruin my ball, so I have to sever those fibers there. Again, you can do it with the axe. I did, that, I did this one with the axe, so maybe I can show the other one with the saw. Oh, what saw are you using? Um, it's called the Cini. I think it's an Italian brand. It's like, it's, um, it's, it's the same version of like the typically, typical Japanese pool sauce, but it's uh, a bit cheaper. Oh, right. <laughs> what, what, what's the spelling of the make? Uh, Ducini, it's like, sit on there. Excellent. Yeah, they make great sauce. And like old times, you have to be careful to, um, to sew it straight or a 90 degree angle to the shape. Because if you do it like that more, and you're concentrating on the line in front, that's not a big deal because at the back you have plenty. But if you do it the other way around, you saw it through your hand at the back. So just try to keep it level. And I don't want to go all the way up to my, to my handle because with the knife, because it's a curve, I want to have some wood after the cut to make a cl nice clean cut with the knife. Same thing on the other side. Check it, because those saws go fast. Whoops, yeah, just about there. So the width here should be the same as in the back. That's a little tell if you have done it level. So then I start first to come up here with gentle, actually try to split it off. So like that, you see? And then the split you made ended up at the saw cut. And just be sure you don't cut behind the saw cut. So something like that. Do the other side as well. Sometimes if the grain I always check the grain because if there's a twist in the grain, it can be that it looks like you're going to end up in the soccer, but if the grain twists it, it can twist down after the soccer. So just check it once in a while. Like this look, yeah, that looks nice. A bit more in front. Like that. Then for those two sections, it depends on the curve of your ball and how the ball is shaped. Because it's, if it's a slow uh, curve, you can mostly do the most of the work like that. Because this one goes inwards, I have to put my X like that, and then all the power is lost in that movement. So to prevent that from wiggling, I can put it on the axe on, on the side of my axing block, put your fingers away, give it a rest here for extra control. And then a lot of people start chopping away here. I don't do that because every time you pass through the wood, you end up hitting your, your uh, handle. So try to do it just here and try to hit the right line. And these fibers are quite short, so they break off anyway. You see? And of course you can't make such a small turn maybe with the axe. You can do fiddle it a little bit more, or you can just leave that block on and do it with the knife. A bit more from there, but... So the point is to do it in one go. Like here, I aim for that line at the beginning. Don't do it in, in steps. So same thing here. I'm creeping up to the line, now I have the line, and axe further, and it all breaks loose. Easy. Maybe a bit more there. 
there's always a balance as how far you have to go with the axe and well, on a small spoon like that it doesn't make that much a difference one or two millimeter knife work is also but on a big spoon I really put my effort in to remove as much with the axe as possible so I have to finish that shape at the back of the handle like that and then I'm almost finished with the axe um, I can tweak it a bit here and there but for before I end up with the, the, the knife work it's still way too thick here and then I have to think I always like to evaluate when it looks much more like a spoon so that's a too big of a bump but I wanted to make maybe a double crank in here so I have to I'm gonna put a little bit out of the bump but leave enough bump to, to do a double crank here but that's still way too thick so I have to get some more of the back A bit like that, and then the rest I'm gonna cut away from the back. So, as safely as possible, you try to do as much as you can with an axe. Yeah, but it depends on several things, it depends on how efficient or good you are with the axe, and of course, with the knife afterwards. That's one thing. Um, if you end up like, in, in the basic courses, I, I try to encourage people to go as far as possible with the axe because they l mostly look at that tool as a, cr as, a cr as a tool for like rough work, but it can be very accurate, of course. So, and I really encourage them to go up to the line. But actually, the, the more um, experience you get with the axe, it turns quite the opposite. You, you leave a bit more for the knife because as I will show, if you can do long strokes, it's easier if you have some thickness left. Because if I want a flat surface on and a smooth surface on that side, it's easier for me if I can have a sliver of one millimeter that's really taking off in one go, then I have to really do small cuts. So it actually makes sense after some experience to leave a few more extra millimeters of wood on just to get a better knife or a faster knife finish. That's the idea. So yeah, so that is still a bit thick and the top of my ball is still thick, so I have to address that a bit. So that's like the final stage of the axing, just here and there. Okay. So I have like, I like the, the crank, that's okay, so I have a double crank in here with the knife, so that's ready for knife work. So the uh, King of Belgium is in his throne. <laughs> 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 so we're going to be starting with the knife work and we actually just mentioned something off camera that I thought would be quite interesting to talk about on camera is obviously this is a, a chair that you've made. Yeah. Now typically when we were setting up for the shot uh, uh, before we started filming obviously Lee Stoffel was here uh, and he was mentioning that how when he sits on a chair he doesn't like um, armrests. He yeah. finds they get in the way but you do have. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah it's funny you mentioned that. Um, I can't imagine with certain grips they can get in the way like if you um, if you would use a forward grip like to do that um, well even so it, it depends on it maybe limits your ability to move out or to so but I'm, I don't use that grip often so um, as you will see when I carve the spoon um, like all the grips I use like that like that chest lever chest grip my arms and elbows are always raised up above my armrests so it's just comfy to relax and <laughs> <laughs> why not? <laughs> yeah, so it's nice to, to sit in that chair. So they're not in my way, but it, I think it depends a bit on how, well, which grips you use and how you go about it. There's some grips like people put their arms on their legs and stuff like that. I, I never use those. So I always sit back relaxed and so, um, 
So basically, because of your techniques, you find so, yeah. having the rest don't really get in the way. No. Or maybe it's the other way around. I just like sitting in that chair and adapt my carving so I can <laughs> keep sitting in that chair. <laughs> don't know. <laughs> so starting with the knife work then, first before we do that, could you talk a little bit about your actual knife? Yeah. Um, so the blade is from uh, Nick Westerman. Um, it's a lovely blade. I had it for. I used to have had a hollow, but I, yeah, I use it so much. So the hollow is grind out, and now it's flat. Um, and actually, the, the handle I, I made from buck oak that came from um, a nature reserve close from where I live. Interesting, actually, they they dated the oak up to uh, five thousand two hundred years old. Oh wow! Yeah, so it's really in black. It's like, if you know ebonizing, it's the natural way of ebonizing because the oak fell into a swamp with the acid, acidic uh, swamp water. Um, and it also has some metals in it and it reacted with the tannins in the oak. So, and like ebonizing is first on it's just the surface coloration, but if, if, it, if that oak is in water, in that water for more than thousands of years, it gets black through and through. So, and it's a really nice, rare wood. And if I would found that piece of wood millions of years later, it would be, uh, it would have been um, coal, so. Wow. Yeah. So, talking of the knife process, um, where would you like to begin, Harold? Um, I have like, well, again, you have to be flexible on depending on what kind of spoon you're making or what, what kind of, things are a priority but for me it makes sense to start off on the sides so I first do handle then neck the neck transition and bow yeah and within that order it makes sense to me to do the sides of my handle first because now I still have the center line for me to view so I do the sides first and then I can get rid of the, the center line and carve the top face and if the top face is finished then I know how much I have left to go underneath it so handle first, neck transition, and then ball. So let's start with that. Like I said earlier, if you have some beef left on there, it helps if you like doing those grips, if you can take a big shaving, if you can do it in one go, like that, you already have a clean finish. So and it helps if you have some wood left on there to, to get a quicker clean finish on there. So, and here I'm getting into the neck transition. I just leave those on. I don't want to be bothered that, that if it, to get, get rid of them and maybe come back into there. So if I come back, I have another one and I keep getting going back and forth. So no, that's just, that's the next stage. So I can leave them on. So I try to make a nice finish. So like that. So. That side's done, actually. So that, that here, that looks all right. Maybe a little hollow in there, maybe nice. A bit more, like that, okay. So, because if I flip it over, I won't see the lines anymore. I just check now, I have a bit more off to come off here. So start off there. Yeah, so I want to make a nice thin neck so I can copy that there. And, and, and um, the easy going thing is like, it doesn't have to be fully symmetrical of course, because it's an asymmetrical handle, so you can play around with it a bit more. That looks like nice. So it, it's kind of smooth now, I have a little crack in there apparently. A bit more until the crack disappears. Yeah, it goes. So try to smooth finish it. Then from here on, it's potato or thumb push, but the grain, just that last bit, still that way up. Yeah, like that. And from here on, it's that way. Check my drawing again, my shape. So you're constantly referencing your drawing and your shape? Yeah, because I'm going to lose the, the, the center line, so I want those to be 
maybe not quite finished because later on I, I put some facets in and stuff so I, I tried to within a millimeter or so make them like the finished surface a bit like that maybe get the neck a bit thinner there so you can see my drawing is always like a guideline but not a, a fixed endpoint I have a little bump there okay yeah that's it so because I established those sides and I'm happy with them now I can cut off the, the top side and if I want a little double crank so I try to get it in with the knife and every time I go back to that same surface I try to put my knife as level as possible because if you do it a bit like that and a bit like that you all have different facets and you don't get a get a smooth finish and if you look at the side profile now it's still flat so I need to go a bit more deeper in there to have like a double crank so a bit more now I'm getting a slight hollow a bit more it's like uh, it doesn't have to be much but just a little bit makes it that more interesting I think so it's getting there yeah and then I try to follow a smooth surface down I don't want to carve away my ball drawing so end up there so that's the top of the handle I have the sides done and now I have a visual on how thick it's left so and the bottom of the handle actually starts here of course because that was the highest point so I come back from there I can do the chest grip um, not until the very end so so I have to stop here because I keep cutting my sweater and then the last bit if it needs taking off a lot I do the chest lever grip and try to continue the smooth surface and this is the back of the handle isn't it yeah yeah that looks a little bump there like that so that's the basic shape of the handle done so the idea that I, I leave all those stuff on there is because um, first now I'm going to go backwards from from the ball up to the neck transition because I don't want to finish that off because I'm not finished with that and I'm not sure where I, I'll end up here so it makes sense to me to do that section now and if I'm happy with that, those sections and the handle then it's time to finish it off and remove all that bulk and finish it off so I have a little hollow here like that and naturally they just come off so that's the basic shape my spoon is a bit wider on that end so I have to make it a little bit thinner there yeah, like that. Try to do the other side. Yeah, it's getting that it's, it's an imbalance, but my ball is a bit too thick on that side. Take a bit off. So that section looks better. A bump here. So I'm just looking at that section, those corners, just because they how they end up into the smallest section of my neck. I want those established and finished because I don't want it 
go back too much at them and end up getting in my neck again. So, but you can tweak it a little bit afterwards, but just make the basic shape that you're happy with. Bit back and forth with thumb push. Like so. That's getting there. A bit wider at the back here. Like that. Okay, so I'm happy now with those. And I was happy with that section of my handle. So now it makes sense just to finish the, the small, the, 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 the thinnest part of my neck. So the thing is, if you, it depends on the wood and the grain of the wood. Like if you come that way, you got stuck into the grain. And if you go backwards, then you can get stuck again. So a little tip maybe is like, what I do is like, I, I finish it off as nice as I can. And then if you have, um, you need a sharp knife yeah and the thing is like if you have a, the, at the lowest part or the thinnest part the, the the grain direction changes yeah so what i try to do is get as close as possible as i can but i have some maybe i, I, I put some in here like some uh, bits that are still left and because you got a bit in the wrong direction what i try to do is with the point of my knife and really with a slicing motion because to make the most use of the of the bevel I try to slice and cut what happens is I go beyond the, the thinnest part so I carve a little bit up grain you see because the thinnest section was here so I'm, I'm beyond that and I carve up grain and I can't go infinitely up grain but so it broke off here so if I come back now I can clear that section and I just be sure that I don't end up in the thinnest part again. But I don't have to because I passed it in the beforehand. So and that's and now that's smooth. Does that make sense, Seth? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Same on the other side. So finish it off nicely. And maybe have some bits in there. So try to get it all and go behind. But you really need a sharp knife and really have a slicing motion to get behind that. Okay. So, handle basically um, done. So the, the first, the neck transition and the beginning of the ball. So next up, because I still have the, the center line and I want to finish the, the outer shape of my ball. So first, put it roughly the right, it's still too pointy for my taste. Round it off a bit. So the, 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 the potato grip, like I call it, it's like the only grip, I'm still practicing that, but it's, uh, it's actually the only grip that can go around a curve, because all the other grips, it's, it's with the thumb push, it's very hard to go around the curve, and with all the other grips, they, they don't go around curves, so I'm still practicing, and I've seen some carvers that really are efficient, like you go in one go around the curve, you see? So, and it, all the stuff you can carve in one go, it's smooth. Because the definition of not being smooth is because you got back at it several times and made just a little, carved in, in a little different plane. This is rounded in there a bit. I have to flatten that side a bit. So just tweaking a bit here and there until you're happy with the overall shape of the ball. So Harold, what is next in the process? Yeah, so now I'm quite happy with the overall shape. So and my handle is on all sides done or almost done. But now if I, before I 
I want to carve more on the bowl, so I have I've did the outer shape. Of course, we have to hollow it, and then bring the bottom around to to um, to the the bowl itself. But the first thing I have to do is like look at the side profile because I don't know how far I can go from the underside if I haven't finished that line first. And because we've cut in the crank with the with the axe, I have some. It's like a corner here, and I want a smooth, curvy transition instead of a, a chopped in corner so that's the first thing I do um, and I, I went a bit deeper here so I'm gonna do that side first and then try to mimic it at the other side so that's my highest point that's the lowest point somewhere here and and my my crank should be maybe a bit more there so I can pull it back a bit so there are two grips, different grips to do that side and to that side. So this side I do like a potato grip and turn around and I'm only focusing on the edge because this is, will be hollowed out anyway so do it like that. I want to get rid of that broken fibers here so and here I feel like I'm at the end of the so then I come from the other way going down You see, and now I have like a nicer curved side profile. That looks about right. So I try to do it on the same on the other side, but I can't do it with the potato grip. So I do the chest grip, but like the reinforced. So and I'm not pushing. That's a normal reinforced chest grip. Now I use my extra fingers as like a pivot point. So I pivot my other hand around those fingers, so I can start from here and pivot like that. I can go the same way like here, I can go a bit up the grain if you have a sharp knife. So I'm a bit up the grain, so that makes it easier if I come down there. I try to meet that section like that and I'm not back in the deepest part again, like so. And because you lower that a bit, it, you can see some nooks and crannies showing off because my side wasn't totally so I in between I correct it a bit to make it nice again. But now I'm happy with that side profile. And now you can choose to you can hollow it out first or do the bottom first. Because I I always because it's an eating spoon, I often put it in my mouth just to check it because there's, there's a fine balance that it's deep enough but not too deep that, it, that the corners catch your inner lip and on the inside of your lips here so for me it always makes sense to hollow it out now until I'm really happy with how it feels in my mouth and I have a smooth finish on there and then I know exactly how far I can go from the backside if that makes sense so you're so what you're doing, you're thinking about the actual usability. Yeah, a lot. Yeah. Because it's, it's one thing to carve a nice spoon and, and I try to make them nice, but for me they're always useful objects. So I, 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 the most, actually the most important thing is how it feels and how it works and how it, uh, yeah, it has to be a usable thing. So hollowing out, because we are at the residence of Lee Stoffer, I thought I'd take my scope out from Lee. <laughs> <laughs> so for those that may not be familiar with the scope, do you want to talk a little bit about this? Yeah, it's an amazing tool. It's like a teardrop shape. Um, so it's uh, like a right hand and left hand at spoon knife all together. So it, that's all cutting area here and that's the back. And it's amazing for like scoops. If you have a real deep bowl, they really work very good there. But of course, you can use it as a just uh, as an average spoon knife um, with the extra that if you're right-handed like I am, you can use the, the other side to make like a pushing cut, what we that you normally could do with the left-hand spoon knife. So I think that's actually one quick thing important to to touch on is. Obviously, you're using the least off a score, but if people just have a simple spoon knife, they can just use that, can't they? Of course they can, yeah. Um, I, I finish up with a, 
nor more normal spoon knife, so we cover them both. Um, for me, it always makes sense to go across the grain. Yeah, because if you're going across the grain, you can come in the cut and turn, turn it and coming out again. So you can, can make a cut all in one go, like that. So I start at the middle and deepen in that, go a bit off, a bit higher, a bit lower, make it rounder. So actually, you want to make a bit like the end result in, 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 a, in a small. So and. I don't want to go very deep and then do the sides because if you go too deep you have to get rid of that area, you have to stay away from that area and then it gives me stress, I can't go there anymore. So I like to have a, like the shallow version or the tiny version of the end um, ball I want to make. So, and I, I do it sideways so across the grain because I can come in and come out. If you go with the grain, like if you're going down, you end up here jam because of the grain and then you have to come back that way so that never makes sense to me but of course you can I sometimes do it like that or maybe that's not really safe way because if you're doing you have much more power because this you're only using your four fingers and you, you counter push with your thumb like the, 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 the potato grip if you do it like that you can use your whole arm into the push but of course safety wise there's much more room for jumping out so you have to be really aware where the knife is going to end up if you do that but it just speeds up the process a bit. So if the packet go about here. So it's a nice chair, it's a bit hard, but it's really dense. So now I creep up to the sides, little by little. I don't go all the way up to the sides, that's for finishing, but... And for me the ideal eating spoon, so the, the, most, the deepest part should be around here somewhere. You can go very steep in from that angle, but from there on up till the top, it has to be quite flat. Otherwise your lips can get the food out of it if you have a really big ridge here. So that's deep enough here, I think. Like that. But I can go way deeper on that area, so that's what I do now. Once in a while feel it, because the deeper you go, the easier it normally goes to scooping out. And sometimes you get carried away, as some of my course participants do, and then before you know it, you have a, like a hole in your spoon. And one of the decisions you have to make on that stage is how you want the bowl to end up into the handle. So you can make it a bit straightish, you can make it round. What I like is like yeah, the ball ends up in a pointy bit and you can't carve the point with the knife. So the, the thing is you have to do it the other way around. So you first carve it quite deep into the handle and of course with the spoon knife you can only carve it round. But afterwards when we put in the facets it's going to end up like a point. So I go a bit deeper there.
bit more like that. Yeah. So I think I'm getting there, so I've put it in my mouth now. And the main thing is how high these are. So I sometimes have to lower them a bit. And I'm going to finish it a bit more and then feel it again. It's just that balance between make the spoon a bit deep. They can be used for a lot, lot of stuff. But still feeling very uh, comfortable. Okay, getting there, so I can feel it again. Now just feel those sides just catching the side of my lips just a little bit. So if I think I'm gonna, yeah, and I've checked it and didn't check it enough before, so that one is a bit lower than that side. So I have to lower that just a tiny bit. Yeah, now it's gone. So that, that made the difference. Yeah, that feels nice now. So I roughed out the bowl now. It's not finished. So that's the last stage that I do on the whole spoon. Smooth, smooth everything out, carve facets, smooth out the bowl. But I'm happy with the shape, so... And uh, it ended up just maybe yeah, a few more shavings to make it really nice. But I have enough depth and insight now in how my deep my bowl is gonna be. Maybe a bit, bit there. Yeah. So... At this stage, I can now go at the back of the spoon and work it up to, to that line. And the decision now I have to make is like, do I want to round it off or work in facets or... So, what do you want, Zed? Mm, I think round it off. Round it off. So keep feeling it. Because that line is already nice and where you want it, you can really come up to it. And I try to end up with like maybe one millimeter, two millimeter, and all round. So I, do, I use a lot of thumb push. Um, if you do like really a slicing motion, like a, it's a combination of thumb push and thumb pivot. And if you use both, you can really get some big chips out of the way with that grip that you also can use for finer finishing cuts. So I first roughly cut in the the round or the rounded shape and then I then I slow down a bit and then carve away all the ridges to make it like a smooth finish like a, a rounded shape you can't with a, with a straight knife with a flat knife you can't really carve it very smooth 
but depends on how long you want to get rid of the, the ridges. You see, it, it takes just little sa shavings. I ride across the surface and every little high spot got cut away. And if you do that on the whole surface, it just ends up smooth enough. So that's the front of the bowl. I have to do that a bit more to and keep feeling. There's also a balance in how thin you want the eating spoon to be because of course the thinner you make it, um, it looks it can look nicer if it's nice and thin. And it feels it has to be thin enough to feel nice in your mouth, but it ha doesn't have to be super thin. To, to be comfortable and it's also at least a, a bit of a stronger spoon. I have spoons that's so thin that you can flex them and this may be nice but it doesn't have to be. I like to chuck my spoon in a rucksack somewhere and I want to be sure it doesn't break whatever I put else I, I put else in the rucksack. So getting there happy with the shape maybe test it a bit yeah, feels nice. And then, <coughs> so because I rounded that off, sets, and I want to do facets, so maybe I can do s a little bit extra, like s try to make it a nice transition, maybe round it off, so that this gets to a rounded transition. Like so. So I have to cut that a bit deeper. We have a small, I don't know if you can catch it on camera, it started to be a small ridge line here. Uh, I think that can be nice as a transition to the, from the bowl to the handle. Does it show on camera, Ted? Just about. There. Mm -hmm. If you cut it a bit deeper, it will be more pronounced. It's a bit hard to keep it symmetrical. So, um, of course with cherry, like you can already see it, my hands were a bit dirty, it starts to stain a bit. But also cherry is like a, a real oxidizing wood. So that means if it dries, um, it will, will, will like get like a dirty layer on there. So if you know that beforehand, like alder is like a typical species that oxidizes as well, you could choose to not finish the spoon in one go because if you want to get rid of the the brownness that gets on there um, you have to go back at it when it's fully dry so if you know that you could you could say okay I'm gonna leave it now and finish off the facets and when it's fully dry um, because of the video we're gonna finish it now and I try to finish my spoons mostly in one go um, you don't have to, in my opinion, you don't have to always let them dry first and finish later because um, you, sometimes it helps with very soft woods like willow or poplar or something because it's really fibrous and it hardens the wood if it's drier so it gets a better finish. But like a quite dense cherry like that one, you can finish it um, but except for the oxidization. So. Um, yeah, I'm quite happy now with the overall shape of the spoon. So last step is like I go over the whole thing again, just tweaking it here and there and put the facets in. So it has started raining, if you do hear the raining in the background. So Harald, what is next in the process? Yeah, so... Um, now I'm going to go over the spoon again, like 
like with a different look like really get in zoom into like a little nook uh, corners a bit here not quietly smooth like a nick there I'm gonna finish that off and in the meanwhile I'll gonna finish the bowl try to smooth it out and then carve facets it always makes sense to me to leave the facets for the last because if I put a facet on there and then afterwards I have to change one of the main planes then you re reduce the facet again so it makes sense to do that at, at the end so so but because I want to make a pointy bit here the the bowl has to be finished before I put that facet all, all in so that's the first thing I'll do now I use a different spoon knife so that's a regular spoon knife um, who, who, who's that boy? Uh, Kai Embretson from uh, Sweden it's with the Bogo handle I made so that's his logo K-A-K-E -E. he makes very nice tools uh, spoon knives and sloy knives so I keep feeling it if it's smooth enough I think there there are two ways to, to go about smoothing a bowl with a the, with the spoon knife so one is like if, if you look at it like that um, you have different radiuses in the spoon knife and I try to put the spoon knife on a section and take that section of the spoon knife that fits that section the best so if I want to smoothen out that that area like so that almost uh, fits nicely so the better it fits that curve on that part of your bowl the more you can cut in one go and the, the smoother finish you leave so it, it looks like I'm just going that but I'm really I'm at, with every stroke I'm like positioning my my spoon knife that it really fits into the the shape of the bowl so the more it fits you just go across and the the higher surfaces just got cut away so and that's quite smooth now another way to do it is like um, you go like that because I'm using now a, a more hollow bit of my spoon knife so that curve is way more curved than that fat section but you can just do a little bit and then of course you make a corner but then you can change that corner down all the way to the middle of the spoon so eventually it will disappear in the the section I already flattened here So it's never, if you put a, a magnifying glass on it, it's never totally smooth. You're always left with the little corners of the tool. But at one point it's just smooth enough for to do its job. So if you come that way, if you come down the other way, some of them will be cut off. And the rest of them you can always come across the grain again so it takes a bit of time just feel and try to get it as smooth as possible I always keep coming back to with my thumb because the light can be deceiving it can look in certain light like it's finished but when you rub your thumb over it it's totally not and the ridge I always try to make it disappear like there's no ridge on there only on the side so and but that ends up with a little sharp corner so the last thing I do afterwards is like put a little chamfer on there just to get rid of that sharp edge And it helps if your spoon knife is quite sharp, you can really make fine <sighs> shavings, just the tiniest bumps and <sighs> bit more there.
it there. I was getting there. <clears throat> Almost. I'm feeling um, if your fingers are a bit dirty, they, the dirt transfer to the ridges on your, uh, so dirty hands can help you make nicer spoons. So you just rub the dirt on the edges, on the, the high spots, and just, just whittle them away. So I'm, I'm quite happy now with the, the bowl. So then go back with the, the straight knife and just feel and look a bit more closely and just remove the last bits of of a ridge here and of course it depends on when you're happy I think at this stage the, the spoon is smooth enough to be usable. There are not really any cracks in there or something. So, but sometimes just put put a little bit more effort in it. Just make such a nice spoon. Just ride that flat like. I use the flat of my knife, just like almost like a plane, and I ride that surface totally flat, and I push hard against it. And what happens if it come across a bump like here? It automatically takes the bump off. You see? So you actually using the flat of your knife as a as like a plane iron. Okay. So. Now with the handle, I'm going to start with the facets. And because it's an asymmetrical handle, you can be a bit creative more with the, the facets. Like that. Um, and I feel like if I look at the overall shape, like this section is a bit wide or chunky in comparison to the, to the bowl. But if you put a bigger facet on there, because your eye always looks at the planes and not the ridges, you can give the illusion with a facet that that section is not as big as it is. So if I go, I have to check the grain. Uh, yeah. Like that. I'm not sure how. You have to be aware of grain direction and cutting direction. So I think from there on, I have to go downwards. So the more you can cut in one go, the better finish you have. I'm going to start for a second, I will continue that later on. I just want to finish the handle first. And, uh, I'm not sure you see it on camera, but that section looks like narrower than it really is because it's not that big because you have three planes now. So want that one a bit bigger. Like that. With a little something here. Just to cut off, okay. And that would make a nice 
surface to do some chip carving on or some decoration. And now what I talked about in the beginning, because now I have a rounded end of my ball, but if I run the facet there, what happens, and if you really take the facet to the middle, so on that side, and the same on the other side, so take the facet right up to the middle of the handle, and then come into the ball. What happens, this is, the ball is now going to a point. And I think that's a nice little feature. So then I'm gonna trace that facet down just on the border of the ball, just to get rid of that sharp, little sharp corner there. I can't go any further, I felt like the grain was a bit tearing, so I have to come from that way. Try to blend it in. And if you go too deep, you can always get your spoon knife again and make it a bit thinner. And try to blend those two now on the top. And you're doing that at a bit of an angle as well, aren't you? Yeah, a bit, not totally flat, a bit outwards. So, um, so just a chamfer that edge makes it more nicer in your mouth and also a sharp edge is more prone to, to breaking off. So it adds strength and comfort at the same time. So a little corner there, just tweak it a little bit. That's better. It also looks like a nice finish because you see now in certain light you have like a clean line running around the ball. A little here. Yeah. So that's my top surface done. Now I have to think about the, f the facets on the, on the bottom side. Um, here it was quite obvious which direction I had to cut my facets because like a facet is a, a plane in between the two main planes to cut the corner off, yeah? But the top plane was going down, so cutting direction was that way, going down. The side plane, that one, was going that way as well because it was from white to thin. So if you have two main planes going in the same direction, it's not, it's not hard to know for the facet to go in the same direction, yeah? But something else happening if you want to cut that corner off, because that corner now, that facet will be the middle between that plane and that plane. And they have the opposite cutting direction because the bottom of my handle was that way, going up, but the side was going down. So the question is, if I put that facet in, which direction is it? Yeah. And again, if you can do it in one go, or as much as you can in one go, without combing against the grain, you have a smoother finish. So it would be nice to know which direction I have to cut. And there are like two ways to go about it, or think about it. So one is like, here, do you have like um, a dominant plane? Just a way of explaining it. If I look at that section, that section here, from top view, it only goes just slightly uh, through the grain. It's just from a little bit bigger to a little bit thinner. So that's not much that it goes through the grain. But if we look at that way, it really goes through the grain that way. So that bottom side goes way more across the grain than that side. So because that one goes more across the grain, that's the dominant side. So it makes sense that if I put a 45 degree facet, I have to go with that one. Yeah. And to be extra sure, you don't have to put it in at 45 degrees. If you like tilt it a bit more, like say 30 degrees, then you're almost going with, with the, the, the cutting direction of that bottom side. And if you would tilt it that way, you probably have to go that way with the side, with that side. Okay, so to make, to make it really sure, I'm going to do I can't, I have to think where I'm going to start my facet. Maybe that's a nice place to start it. I'm going to start thin, like so. 
and I'm not at 45 degrees, I'm a little bit more flat, so I can make that, and then I can go all the way up there. So if you can do it in, or try to do it in one go, you have a nicer finish. And that's the same, so I started off there somewhere. Like that. Like that. So I couldn't go any further because of the chest grip here. So I tried to flat my knife to rest in the same plane as the, the facet and then just continue it around the corner. Like that. And then that's the last one. And so the facet looks, I, I like the finish of the facets and also when, it, when you hold it, when you hold your spoon, you don't feel the, the hard ridges anymore, so it has a better touch to it. So the last thing that's left, and maybe I should have done that before I put those two facets in, is just, just whittle a little bit more away at the back to smoothing out because yeah, you ask for a rounded surface set, so I'm going to try to give you a nice rounded surface. So it's riding with your edge just over that surface and let it catch the, the high spots. Just keep feeling it. There's a little ridge there, I can think I can go like that. And needless to say, with these finishing cuts, it's always beneficial to have a sharp knife. Yeah, it is. Yeah, the sharper it is, the, the finer last shavings you can make. But then again, it doesn't have to be... I like a very smooth inside of my bowl, just for the feeling when you, you use it. But sometimes I, I, I purposely texture the bottom side, so it doesn't matter that much. Uh, it has to be smooth enough, but... So yeah. And then, yeah, just go around it and maybe look at from a distance, you have any corners or just not perfectly cut sections. Feel it a little bumpy there. And so I'm getting to the end of the, the spoon. Like I said, it, it's going to oxidize a bit, so, um, so maybe I can carve away the oxidization, the, the brownness that we'll see after it's dried. Um, there's a tip that you can um, prevent, maybe not totally, but if you, if you worry about oxidization, uh, a trick is to uh, force the drying process of the spoon. Um, so if you put it over like the, the heater inside, of course you can't force it too much, but it can split if you would put it in the oven, like a fresh spoon, um, but the more you, you speed up the drying process, the less oxi oxidization you get. So, and with a cooksa or like, uh, you can't do that because of course it will, uh, it can crack. But with a spoon, and if I'm happy with the finish now, I can just put it over the, the heater in, indoors and it gets dry in a few hours and then you get less oxidization and you keep the, I learned that from a Sweden when they have the, like the creamy white birch. Um, and if you want to leave it that way without refinishing it the whole spoon, they put it over the heater to keep the whiteness. So on the topic of drying, um, what is your preferred method for drying spoons? I just leave them where they are. <laughs> <laughs> At home is my table here full of tools and stuff and I'm just, yeah, just leave it there and go back to it, whatever I think about it. So. Yeah, after it's dry, then 
if you would do li like some chip carving, it's better on a dry spoon or some other decoration techniques or painting or whatever. Um, and then the final thing is oiling it. You don't have to oil it, but if you want to leave the, the natural color of the wood as long as possible, you should oil it because, because actually the grain of the wood was that way, that way. So at all different areas, we cut through the grain, through the fibers of the wood. So they're all little microscopic holes. And if you're not filling in those holes with oil, they'll fill up very fast with um, spaghetti sauce or curry sauce. So it will be much faster. It, it turns red or yellow or whatever stuff you're eating much faster. So that does um, Bel Belgium chocolate improve <laughs> the finish, finish of the spoon. <laughs> <laughs> would be nice taste, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> we, should, we should carve a chocolate spoon, Zed. Oh, man. <laughs> Strictly for research purposes. <laughs> yeah, we have to try so different neat. types of chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the final thing I think to, to wrap up on, uh, Harald, is yeah. um, to let the viewers know that you, I believe you have a book coming out soon. So would yeah. you like to tell us more about that? Yeah. Um, I've been working on it last year, it was a dream came true um, and a publisher approached me to, um, to write a book on, 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 on green woodworking. It's, it's getting bigger in Belgium as well and um, so be proud, I'm a bit proud to, to say that it's, it's, it's going in print next week and in three weeks time it will be uh, out in the bookstores and in my store. Um, of course, it's it's a Dutch book. Um, so if any of you or is a viewers is an English publisher, please help me and contact me to get an English version out there. Now it's um, it's called Hard for Wood. Um, the title. Um, and what is that in Dutch? Hard for Hout. Right. Yeah, it sounds a bit the same. So and that that's basically the 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 basic of the book. It's like written for everybody like me has a, a love for wood, for trees, and making stuff out of it with simple tools. And uh, so it has a section on, the, um, of course, on using axes and knives and saws and uh, a lot of uh, information on wood, the, the anatomy of woods and trees, how they grow, which parts you can use and why and stuff like that. Then have four um, practical chapters. One is making stuff from sticks, like the coat pegs and, and things like that. Um, and then a chapter on spoon carving, one on shrink pots, and the last chapter is then on cookster carving. And then the, the last two chapters are a big one on sharpening, because sharpening is important. So theory and practical uh, stuff on sharpening. And then the last one is a bit more philo philosophical about why I think that carving and craft in general is uh, good for us uh, in many, many ways. So and it's important to preserve those stuff. Uh, for the future. So yeah, hard for wood. Yeah. And obviously we're going to put a link to your website, so would I assume there's more information on your website? Yeah, and I put some stuff in English as well. <laughs> yeah, because actually we were speaking of camera, yeah. uh, at the moment it's all in Dutch, but yeah, I think over time, bit by bit, you'll be putting little sections in, in English yeah. uh, on your website. And actually something um, I realised that we also should talk about briefly is Every year you actually host an event, a gathering in Belgium. Could you also tell us more about that? Yeah, it's our little spoon fest. Um, I host it, organize it together with Thomas, a friend of mine, also a full-time spoon carver. And um, so it's like a lovely little festival. Um, so n next year will be the second time and uh, we also had a pre-fest. So it's the third, no, the fourth weekend of September. Um, it's about 100 and plus people, uh, 120, 130 people. And we invite several carvers from Belgium and Holland for teaching. And every year we also invite some international guests. So, and Lee, hopefully, uh, he'll decide tomorrow, I think. Uh, Lee will be one of the international hosts, uh, guests, so, and also do pre-fest, so. Um, it's mainly in Dutch, but of course, the international teacher will be teaching in English, so. Everybody's welcome and uh, on my website there's also a link to the translation is from, from our Spoonfest, it's Lepelfeest and that, so the, you, can, you can find the link on my website and see the dates and all the stuff that's going on. 
and hopefully this year, 2023, I'm hoping to come over. Yeah, um, that would be nice, yeah. And, and document the event and obviously the community that's growing steadily, isn't it? In, in, yeah. in Belgium, the Netherlands, there's a really nice community that's evolving. Yeah, it is. And, and when I started off, it was like, I was like the, the strange duck in the, the pond. Is that an expression in English? <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, a lot of my students start carving more and more and uh, the, the, the Spoon Club is growing and there, um, I think we're, we're several, three or four people now doing full-time green woodwork. So. Oh, wow. And their students are also getting more into it. So it's really, yeah, getting bigger. It's nice to be a part of that. And yeah, I'm, I'm uh, really enthusiastic about the future because it's only growing and yeah. It's good for us. But actually, what, one question I do have for you is, it's something maybe actually we should have touched on at the very beginning, and that is, does Belgium itself have a, you know, a, a long history of green woodworking and the skills associated with that? We don't have like a typical kind of spoon or even kind of green wood chair or because, um, and if, if you look at the history of Belgium or Flanders, where I'm from, we've been conquered so many times by so many different countries and cultures. So it's hard to pinpoint like that's typical Flan Flemish or what. So no. And I did some research. Um, the last spoon carver in Belgium um, uh, quit or retired in 1920. So it was 100 years that nobody carved a spoon or almost nobody carved a spoon in, 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 in our region. So, and we, in, in those hundred years, we didn't know, only forget that, that that was ever a job. We totally forgot how to do it. And I think like in the 90s uh, or 80s, it all came back from Sweden, from England, and people like me and others learned it from abroad and brought it back to Belgium. And now, now there's a spoon carvers again in Belgium. I know, you got your own gathering, you got yeah. your own event. Man, you guys are taking over. That's what it is. <laughs> That's it. You're, you're bribing everyone with really good chocolate and then, <laughs> and then spreading the scene. But in all seriousness, it's really genuinely nice to see the community growing in different areas. Yeah. And specifically in Belgium, you know, sometimes we can overlook a lot of countries and not realize actually there's a very steady growing community. And also, like you said, some of the people that start out as students, before you know it, you know, these people are coming very proficient yeah. and very talented at what they do. Yeah, yeah, some are really, really are, yeah. And, and even then, it's, it's lovely. For a lot of people, it stays a hobby, and, and uh, but that's nice, and that's okay, and that's... For me, that's one of the important, most important stuff of my job, because I make a lot of stuff, but I'm mostly a teacher. I think four out of five days I'm teaching and bringing people together and carving and so and that's for me the most important part of my job w working and, and carving with other people and just having fun and connect and so I'm totally not a lonely carver in my workshop I try to be the opposite so so the more people carve and carve together and get together so the more accomplished I feel I think So there you have it, my friends. That is a wrap for this video. Harold, thank you so much. Thank you. The other was mine. Honestly, I, no matter how many times I film these videos, I always learn. I always find it incredibly insightful to see how different people approach ultimately the same process. Yeah. You know, from wood to a finished spoon. So I really do appreciate you taking the time and also just allowing me to document so that may inspire and also help other people as well. Yeah. Um, so thank you so much for that. Thank you. Yeah. So guys, a few things before we wrap up this video. As we've mentioned quite a few things in this video, in no particular order, we talked about uh, a lot of the things Harald has going on in Belgium. So A, he has a regular spoon club. Um, details for that will be on his website. One big thing with a website currently is in Dutch. However, you can use Google Translate to obviously translate that into English or whatever your language is. Also moving forward, little bit by little bit, Harald is going to be adding some English elements on there as well. So basically the website is where you're going to be able to find out about a spoon club. If you're based in that region or you happen to be in the area, uh, then obviously do check that out. And you know, it's an invite from Harald for you to come down. And obviously you can speak to him via the website to organize the specifics in terms of logistics. Also, we referenced the annual gathering in September, Harald Holes, which is like a national gathering in Belgium. 
all being won in 2020-23, the year that we film in this video. I really do hope to be going down to that for the first time and documenting Haral, the event, and obviously the other talented people that are in that region. Also, something that we actually didn't touch on uh, on this video just yet, and that is, Obviously you're doing this full time in Bruges um, where you're kind of located, but you also run courses and tuition like one-on-one -on -one and groups, etc. Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah, so most of my weekends are filled with group courses like on shrink pots and cooks and spoons and different uh, areas of spoon carving. Um, but during the week I do um, with children or and I do a lot of one-on-one -on -one courses. So, so maybe that's an invitation if people are fancy coming over to visit Bruges and in the meanwhile, do a one-on-one uh, -on -one course and yeah, whatever kind of stuff you want, yeah. you're willing to learn to make. So yeah, yeah happy and, to have them. And for that, there's obviously more details on your website. Yeah, there is, yeah. Uh, and people can contact you. And also that ties into the fact that, as I mentioned at the very beginning, Harad obviously has his website, but he's also very active on Instagram. So you can contact him through any of those mediums. Should you have any questions or queries about visiting either the Spoon Club, the Spoon Gathering, the annual one, and also also just to see you know, Harald at work, you know, and in terms of the teaching. He has a fantastic setup there, so it's also something I'm really looking forward to documenting on video yeah. uh, at some point this year. Um, and as mentioned throughout this video, obviously in terms of the technicality, this is a lengthy video, that's because obviously we've left no stone unturned. And so a reminder that we do have a timestamp on the bottom of this video, and also uh, written below in the description, if you click on that time part on the left, it will jump straight to that section uh, of the YouTube video, because obviously the idea with this video is it provides you some inspiration, whether you're a complete beginner, an intermediate, or even an advanced. Hopefully there's something that you can take away from this video. And those time sets will allow you to kind of navigate your way through when you go back and if you do go back to use this video as a point of reference. So links to everything that I've discussed are going to be below in the description. It will mean the world to me. There's only one thing that I ask from you and that is if you gain any value from this video whatsoever, it will mean the world to me that you go to uh, Haral's Instagram and you give him a follow, right? <laughs> and it's just my way of saying thank you, you know, um, you know for even for Haral to take the time out. Um, one final thing is if you do carve a spoon on the back of what Harald has shown in this video, which we do encourage you to do, it will mean the world to us and especially Harald if you can tag him on oh, social nice, media, nice, yeah. yeah? So if people can say, yeah, I carved this spoon on the back of what Harald showed in the video. It's always really nice seeing what people do as yeah. a result of the videos. Um, so yeah, it will mean the world to us if you if you do that. And like I said, you know, if you have any questions or queries, Harald is a really, really open guy. You can go and contact him through either Instagram or his website. So Harald, so, thank you once again. Yeah, you too. <laughs> Guys. Thank you. As always, I hope whatever you're doing, you have a blessed day, a blessed week ahead. From myself, Zell Outdoors, and the Spoon King of Belgium, <laughs> Harald Lemon. Peace out. <laughs>